From the Dead Workers Party, a podcast about gaming featuring the people that bring your games to life. These are your core elements. Core Elements, episode 46, recorded on July 9th, 2013. I am Wes Wilson. I am Spencer Williams, and uh, I can't believe you said 2013. That's so stodgy. 2013, <laughs> man, come on. And uh, with us is Ben Prunty. Say hello, Ben. Hello, I'm Ben Prunty. And you are you are well known for uh, for doing a particular game that probably everyone who has listened to this show is well familiar with. W- what are you known for doing the music for? Uh, I made the music for FTL. And um, are, are do you feel evil for sticking that in everyone's head, or? <laughs> um, it's something I always wanted to do, so <laughs> I'm very happy that I've accomplished that. Maybe that makes me evil. Is that the first uh, big project that you've been the composer for? Uh, the first one that was successful, yes. <laughs> well, which Sorry. I don't mean to laugh like an evil maniac there. <laughs> which, which, what, what were some of your un- unsuccessful projects? Uh, I made a lot of stuff for like games that were never released or uh, were just like small hobby projects or something like things like that. Gotcha. Uh, I've been doing music for like 10 years, uh, but FTL was the first time where it was like a hit. And I got paid, and it was great. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! Money. Uh, and and did you get the uh, job working with Gravity Ghost before or after FTL came out? I was actually before. Um, I met Aaron Robinson at the Tig Jam. I don't know if you guys have heard of Tig Jam. I there's have not. A, there's a indie blog called Tig Source run by uh, Derek Yu. And uh, I've heard of that. yeah. So they do a jam every year in Mountain View, California. And uh, so, yeah, I attended that, met Erin there, and she was working on Gravity Ghosts, and it looked really cool. So I attached myself to it. Are, <laughs> are you, um, when you, like, when you think about a game and what you're doing for it, like, like for instance, when you started thinking about doing the music for FTL, what, what you know, what, how did you... What what element of the game did you pick out and try to keep in your mind when you were coming up with the music? Uh, well, space is kind of scary and lonely, so I tried to convey that. Uh, a lot of my inspiration was just like what the designers were telling me they wanted from it. You know, they wanted something that was kind of chiptunes esque and something that wasn't overly dramatic. <clears throat> Uh, so I tried to stick with that kind of style. And how many times did they send everything back to you before you got it right? Uh, very little, actually. They really liked what I did right from the start. So that was that actually worked really well. Have uh, you ever worked with like a, a crazy, um, super picky designer who like they send this back? No, it's crap. No. <laughs> um, I've had I've had a couple of experiences where someone was was very picky on what things were supposed to sound like. They had a, like they had a very specific idea already of what it was going to sound like. Um, but for the most part, um, usually people just tell me to do what I want. So, which, which is great, you know, <laughs> makes me happy. <laughs> That's always the best thing. Do what you want and we will yeah. be happy with it. Um, so like, ha- are you, are you lining up another project after gravity goes? Are you, are you, is, has this pretty much got your time right now? Um, I'm doing Gravity Ghost. I'm also working on another game. Uh, I can't say the name of it or who's making it yet because they haven't announced it. Uh, but it's like a, a murder mystery horror adventure game. I was totally expecting you to throw some more genres in there, like murder mystery <laughs> horror game, side scroller time travel. <laughs> um, some weird fourth dimensional like, stuff in there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, it's like a, a murder mystery horror game, like like a point and click adventure game. Um, and I've been doing this like awesome jazzy soundtrack for, it, and it's really fun. Uh, cool. So, uh, I'm How- very excited about it. I'll talk. I will t- start talking about it as soon as they announce it. <laughs> how how well does the um, does like 
the the song selling on iTunes and other digital media like are you surprised or disappointed with the sales of game soundtracks uh i am very much happy with the sales uh i sell the ftl soundtrack right alongside the game on steam and that's like my main source of income right now wow that's wow. awesome yeah uh well does, does that mean you're poor <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this, the game's a really big hit, and the soundtrack turned out to be a really big hit as well. So I'm actually doing quite well. And, and when you negotiated with the FTL guys, like, d- d- do they get a piece of the soundtrack cut? I mean, I'm, I'm, th- this might be, you know, too personal or anything. I don't no, know. No, it's all good. Um, they, <clears throat> we, we originally talked a little bit about revenue share, where I was going to get a cut of the game sales. But they, they said they didn't really want to do that, and I said, can I keep the rights to the music instead so I can sell it however I want? And they had no problem with that. They were like, oh, that sounds good. Okay. So I get to, the soundtrack is entirely owned by me, and so I can sell it, and I get, all the money goes to me. Is that is that common? Like, have you talked with other composers that work for other, like, um like companies, the, you know, like when when they when you sell to EA, do you get a similar thing, or is it much more much more? No, no, no. We'll pay you this flat V, and it is ours forever. I'm pretty sure that if you're gonna work in like the AAA industry, uh, a composer is not going to get to keep the rights to their music. Right. Uh, I think it's a thing that only happens with indies. Pretty I much. think that's probably a fair bet. <laughs> yeah. Do you think? Um, you know, I'm I I sort of believe that Did the whole gaming industry is is, is yeah, going to be become <laughs> dominated by mostly <laughs> independent games. Um, I still think there will be a lot of triple A's, but I think okay. that you're going to so we'll see a lot more medium-sized studios like a, building up uh, over the uh, years. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, do you Monica think Red that, um, <laughs> do you think there's going to be more room <laughs> in your field for people that are interested in that? Do you think, I mean, is, is, are you going to become like Danny Elfman and make all the soundtracks for all the indie games ever? That would be awesome. Go back to the No, I think there is a ton of room. I mean, think of how many games. I'll be shipping out slides. Think of how many awesome games came out in 2012. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the games that we've been playing. Seven games. Seven, exactly seven. Yes. Like, think of how many great games. Like, I'm still catching up on 2012. Um, which is easy because 2013 has mostly sucked. Yeah. <laughs> no, it hasn't. Yes, it has. It's been a terrible year. This has been a great year. You're you're so full of it. <laughs> uh, I have a child. I don't have time to play games anymore, so it's a terrible year. No, oh, it's it's not that he doesn't have time to play games. It's that he only wants to play Defiance. That's no, that's not true. <laughs> partially true. <laughs> I had a period where I only wanted to play Monster Hunter, so you know, I understand. Oh my that. gosh, I have that, and it's on my list, and I haven't played it yet. It is so good. Well, okay. Uh, anyway, yeah, I think I think that there's just so many games now coming out from independent studios. Like you go on Kickstarter, and there's just like tons of games. And uh, I think that yeah, there's plenty of room for lots of composers to get attention. Sweet. Well, we will talk more about what you. Wow, who I I, I messed this up. <laughs> just just go to the next segment. I don't even care. <laughs> Lab notes. So this week, uh, I have mostly been working on my upcoming convention, PlayOnCon, of which I have a little over a week to work on it, and I'm about two months behind schedule. So I'm I'm sort of freaking out, and I'm staring at the schedule like a like a the programming schedule like a man caught uh, you know like a deer in headlights. I am I am like totally like freaking out about it. But I have managed to hold on to that rental copy of the last of us. And so how much do you owe on it now? Uh, I've got it from Redbox. It's like two bucks a day. Right. And I've had it for a little over a week. So, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to end up paying about half price for the game to Mm. rent it. I should have bought it and sold the game. 
but I ha- I usually don't do that, and I thought I would kind of barrel through it, but I can only play it after the kids go to bed, and then additionally, like, my wife doesn't really like it because there's kids in Jeopardy, and my wife doesn't handle kids in Jeopardy very well, um, and so, uh, or gore, you know, so it's kind of like, well, I'll wait till she's asleep, you know, so I usually start playing at about 11 o'clock at night, and I'll finish at about 1.30. I- I'm probably about halfway through the game. I'm going to try to barrel through it again over the next couple of nights, and 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 try to get it you know over and done with but i'm really enjoying it At, once i realized it was a stealth game and i started getting into it i've really enjoyed pretty much everything about it other than when i actually have to pull out my gun and fight stuff um the 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 i hate aiming guns on game controllers i don't understand how all these halo players do it it just it's just <laughs> totally alien to me i'm a mouse and keyboard guy and every time that little, like, the worst is the, the, the game puts in motion sway, and I'm having enough trouble aiming at people as it is with the little thumbsticks, and so when you put in the motion sway, it just, it makes me angry. I get livid. Um, so, it, and it would be okay if they gave me enough materials to make lots of Molotov cocktails and, you know, little shrapnel grenade, grenades, and then I wouldn't have to worry about, like, being precise, um, but... Uh, I am really enjoying it. I think the, the the environments change, and I'm impressed with what they're doing. There are small fields laying around for you to pick up and experience. Uh, I, the dialogue is really well done. Everything is just excellent so far, and I, I really can't recommend it enough. Um, I, I have no intention of ever playing it. Why? <laughs> it just... it I, It's Naughty Dog. So? And I feel like they're one of the most overrated. <laughs> I'm not saying this out of, out of spite. I'm saying, I mean, you sent me a copy of uh, what? Uh, Uncharted 2. Uncharted 2. I managed to play like maybe half an hour of it before I was like, this is, this is one of the worst games I've ever played. No, <laughs> no, it is not. You are, you have lied to yourself. You were, you were a victim of some false delusion of horror. I, I enjoy games where I'm not just pressing forward, and that's what it feels like. Oh, no. And the platforming is so brainless. and No. Yeah. you you Oh, that's so disappointing. I loved Uncharted 2. I got about a third of the way through Uncharted 3 and kind of put it down. I haven't picked it back up yet again. I, have, um, I could get Uncharted 3 for free right now because I've got PlayStation Plus. Um, but I really don't even want to bother freeing up the hard drive space for it. Wow, that's pretty brutal. I I am loving The Last of Us. I, I it's it is it is interactive fiction. It is um, less uh, you know I I don't treat it like something where you're gonna you know necessarily be controlling all the time. I mean, so it, it's fine so long as you don't think of it as a game. It, well, there's there's some parts of it that are more about <laughs> experiencing things. The the one problem is a series of like stealth encounters, like one after the other. Then I think you can enjoy it more. Yeah, but there's also like these parts where y- it, it has a very good illusion of not having linear travel. Like you experience a row of houses. And you really do kind of feel like it's a free environment for you to explore and search for the things that you use to make your stuff. Uh, I'm enjoying it. So we'll, we'll move on from that. The next thing I did was I, I finally got around to installing the card hunter beta beta. And I had, it was, it was like pure joy. It was like, it was like just this breath of fresh happiness pouring over me. And I, completely dodged my work for a good four hours while I slogged through. through <laughs> it is a, fantastic. Yeah. And the, now I've gotten to a point where the combat, like as soon as I get dropped on the board, I'm starting to kind of resent a little bit of the combat. Um, but, uh, but all in all, like everything about it feels fun and fresh and I'm enjoying it. Um, there's some, uh, there, there might be some beta frustrations coming from how, you get like, for instance, I'd like some boots with some more attacks. You know what I mean? Like I'd like, I, I'm, I feel like my decks of my individual characters are a little heavy on certain things and I'm not sure the individual like slots where you get cards. Anyway, nobody will understand what I'm talking about unless you played the beta, but, but it is in beta. Yes. The other thing. And, uh, and I did give away some keys last week. Um, so I hope everyone else is really enjoying it, but I, I got to tell you like, 
I hopped right into it. I did not feel there were any barriers to entry. It was joyous right off the bat. They did that wonderful thing that I like where they, they throw you in with like lots of power and then they say, oh, wait, 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 we got to roll up first level characters and then you go back and everything about it is great. And I really recommend if you get a chance to get into it, try it out. So Spencer, what have you been playing? Um, I've had a very light gaming week and I've really only played one thing and that is uh, Guild Wars 2. I got back into it. Um, I've been playing with our friend Clyde Frog and having a blast. And, and uh, it's funny what gets me back into games. Uh, and in this particular case, it was, uh, they said, all those achievement points that you've got, they're going to be worth something. I'm like, oh, I've got a ton of those. <laughs> nice. I'll, I'll play again. So and, and I've got back in, and they've done some really interesting things. The... Uh, there, you know, every MMO has has daily quests, and what they've done is they've actually made it so the daily quests are different every day, and it it there's and you don't have to do everything to finish the daily quest. You can sort of pick and choose right. what you want to do, and uh, I don't know. I'm just really enjoying getting back into it, and it helps that there's no monthly fee, so I didn't have to like type in a credit card number to start playing it again. I keep trying to tell my friends to get into that game, and and I don't know what what it is. I think some people who tried Guild Wars 1 are reticent to try 2, um, and I also think a lot of people are MMO'd out right now. Um, but all in all, like um, I still think that's my favorite MMO experience of the past like year. It's great. I enjoy it. And that's it for me, really. So what about I, you, Ben? Uh, I, I tried to play other games, but failed, so. Oh, really? <laughs> what other game did you try to play? Um, let's see. <laughs> I'm having difficulty, like, assigning the camera because you're stopping and starting a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. It's, uh, I'm trying to remember what it's called. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So, my friend, Random Inuyasha, she is a big fan of these games that are, like, uh, these visual novels that are on the, the DS. And one of them was uh, Nine Rooms, Nine Doors, Nine something. I don't remember. Oh, anyway. I heard, I've heard good things about that. So, and and uh, the sequel is called Virtue's Last Reward. And that just, that that became a free download for the, the Vita with PlayStation Plus. So I'm like, oh, I can play this now. Except I haven't played the first one. So... Uh, I guess I'm not playing it yet. <laughs> so I got out my DSL to play the first one, and I can't find the charge cord. So I played some Guild Wars 2 instead. Man, that is a fail. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm actually thinking I'm going to have to order a new charge cord. Wow. So sad. That is. So what about you, Ben? What have you been playing? I've uh, been playing a lot of Last of Us also. Uh, I think I'm pretty close to the end. Do you agree more with Wes or more with me? I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to agree more with Wes on this one. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. As long as you go into it knowing it's going to be like this movie-like experience, it's, uh, it's really fun. And it's, it, I feel like it's more, it requires more brain power than, uh, than the Uncharted games. Because the encounters well, that's are not a lot hard. more. <laughs> the encounters are a lot more thoughtful. Like you, it's more... It's a more tactical experience than most action games. Okay. Um, I, yeah, so I'm really enjoying that a lot. I, I'll agree. There, there are certain fights where the first thing you want to do is find out where the zombies on the board are. Yeah. And then try to begin to figure out how you're going to get through the room killing them one by one. Yeah, it's less about the execution and more about planning everything. Because the execution part is pretty easy. Like, it's pretty easy to, like, hit a zombie because like you're so, it's sort of like auto targeted and everything, but the point is more about planning your method of attack, right? Um, and guns it, are often a great hindrance. Yeah, so that it makes it a, kind of a different experience, which is really cool. Yeah. Uh, what else have I been playing? I played a lot of Rogue Legacy, uh, and that's pretty fun. 
I'm really looking forward to that game, and uh, we actually have uh, the guys from Rogue Legacy coming on the show next week from Celador Games. Nice. So I'm kind of excited to, to hear from them, although I doubt I will get time to play the game before I actually speak to them. So, Spencer, you have to play more Rogue Legacy. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I can do that. You have to love the old Mega Man games. If you really enjoyed the old Mega Man, it's a lot like that. It, I, I get more of a Castlevania vibe off of it, and I was a huge Castlevania fan, so... Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, definitely the castle exploration is a lot like uh, Castlevania, but I feel like the the incredibly twitchy, like dodging all sorts of crap coming at you at once. Feels yeah, a lot, feels very Mega Man esque. Um, uh, okay, whatever. Yeah. I'm right. Yeah, but, it's really uh, fun. <laughs> um, what what is it that you're like? Are you feeling a whole lot of the the influences from it? Like, I mean, how do you feel about like the whole random, the whole plus and negative thing? Like the traits? Yes. Um, you mean how do I feel? Like, do I like it or yes. not like it? Yes. Or, I I enjoy randomness. I love roguelikes, which is why I bought Rogue Legacy. Pretty much because it had Rogue in the title. <laughs> it was like a guaranteed purchase for me. Yeah. Um, Sounds about I, right. Yeah, I've, I've played NetHack for like, you know, like 15 years now. And, you know, I love Spelunky. And, see, I actually, I always love it when games force you to take random stuff. And so I kind of enjoy that. Although I don't really understand why... Uh, they play up the legacy part of it because it's really just like you get to pick a random character each time. There's no real like inheriting traits from past generations or anything. Is there yeah, not? That is a little weird. Um, it, 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 it's not just that they play it up. It's like, you know, it's in the name of the game. Right. And, and then it's just, it's not really, it doesn't do much. Yeah, it, it's really just picking a random character each time. Do you think maybe that there's like trends of of traits that like this trait will lead will in general lead to this trait or or is it do you feel like it's complete, you know, roll d100? Oh, it's there, completely random. Yeah, there doesn't appear to be any pattern okay. at all. Well, I'm looking forward to playing that. Uh anything else you've been poking around with? Uh I played been playing a little bit of Duel of Champions, which is really fun. Has anyone played that? I, I have been playing it, but I put it down for Card Hunter. Oh, okay. Yeah, Same thing I, here, I actually. I actually was playing it on my iPad, and then uh, for about a week, uh, the iPad version was broken. And, oh, right. Yeah, I heard about that. And then I, st I, I never picked it back up after that. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's really fun. I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I, I had a really good time with it. I, I was getting frustrated, though. I wasn't very interested in playing other people. And the campaign, like, has a pretty steep curve on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, when, it forces you to play multiplayer occasionally, right? Well, it's not that. It's that unless I go and get some new cards, I'm not going to be able to beat the next section. Yeah. So, like, basically what I'm doing is I keep playing it, because I'm, like I said, I'm not really interested in, in playing other people. Uh, so I keep playing the same mission over and over again, hoping I'll get a lucky opening hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, yeah. <laughs> um, but some of these, you know, and then, uh, and then I save up lots of money, and I'll buy, like, a card here and a card there. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Eureka! So there's been a lot of rumors floating around, and, and they have been confirmed. Blizzard has confirmed that they will have an in-game store in, um, in World of Warcraft. Um, yawn. Say what? Yawn. Why, why, does that, why, why does that make you yawn? And who cares? It's World of Warcraft. Because World of Warcraft is still an awesome game. I've never played it. Real? What? Ugh. That just that that defies logic. It is it is it is the seminal MMO. I mean, I I, I Wes, really Wes, you are a stranger in an unfriendly land. No, <laughs> you had a good time playing it too, Spencer. You did. Don't you lie to me. I did, and then I stopped having fun with it, so I stopped playing it. And that's I just never it. Never played a single MMO. What? 
And that's why you have accomplished something in life. Congratulations. <laughs> But I mean, I there you can you can say a lot of bad things about. Okay, well, it, it breaks down here, it breaks down there. But as far as like a game that you can set in front of people and have them play it, they will have fun. At a certain point in time, that joy might break down for one factor or another. But it's hard to say, you know, this is not a good game. Now, I'm not saying it's not a good game, but I'm trying to think of another game that was released in 2006 that I would still want to be talking about now. Well, and uh, there isn't. There are and still 8.3 million subscribers. And yeah. what and and one of the things that this speculates on is that if they can get the in-game store up and running, there is the possibility eventually WoW might drop the subscription model. Would you play again, Spencer? No. I I, no, I, the, I there there are other MMOs that I would, uh, I would have more fun playing that are already free to play. So. Yeah, I I still want to go through the Pandaria content. I am I am I am curious what they're going to do for the next expansion. I will probably play it. Uh, there, they, they create a good MMO, and I have enjoyed it. Even though sometimes I've put it down for longer, you know, I I can't say it's bad. Anyway. In-game store, confirmed. Uh, one of the things they're going to be, like some of the items they're going to be selling are things like, um, you know, like 24-hour wisdom potions, things like that. Stuff that like will help you for, for give you a buff for a long period of time. Um, and I, I don't know. I, I hope that it, it revitalizes things. I'd like for them to take away the subscription model. Um, but you know, who knows? You see, it's just it, the the one of the reasons that I'm I'm not really all that interested in the in-game store is one, uh, it's a very much a following move. Every MMO that I know of right now that I have played in the last year has an in-game store. So it's like, okay, now now WoW does as well. And uh, until we see the store, we won't know how well it's implemented. Let us remember the EVE Online debacle um, of them. You know, they, they still charge a subscription fee and they added an in-game store and they were charging $75 for a space monocle <laughs> that you never see. I don't know about um, you guys. I'd pay $75 for a space monocle. It was, I mean, it was, it was nasty and the, the feedback was terrible and uh, they had a huge player revolt. That was, that was last year. That was the the summer of, of hate. Uh, but <laughs> ah, yes, that, I remember the summer of hate. That, I, I'm, I'm, I, I didn't make that up. I think that's actually what it was called. <laughs> but um, on, uh, on top of that, it's just, you know, if you are playing World of Warcraft, it is interesting that there is now an in-game store. If you are not, the fact that they are now willing to take your money in another way is not going to make you want to play the game again. So... And and that's why I think, it, like I said, it hinges on whether they're going to be able to do the the, uh, the uh, even if they could just pull down the monthly subscription a little bit. I think a lot of people would would they they could keep a lot of subscribers that way. I know some people are like, "This is the death of Wow," and I'm like, "No, it's no, not." Those people are dumb. <laughs> um, <laughs> but there are people that have been claiming that something is going to be the death of Wow for the last five years. So. Yes, yes. Guild Wars One was supposed to be the Wow killer. Do you remember that? Uh, Guild Wars 1 was not a WoW killer. No, but it was supposed to be. I played a lot of it. I did not. Uh, so, uh, this next article that I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, and um, I've got the wrong link here. <laughs> 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 oh no, that's it. That's it. Sorry, I'm being stupid. Live radio. Uh so <laughs> sorry, my brain. Uh so this is a uh, this was an article on a uh, Pixel Enemy and basically what it was talking about was how uh hackers are to blame for some of video game companies' woes. Um, I thought this was kind of interesting, but phishing and hacking um, have picked up to such a degree that uh, they, uh, for instance, the the attack on Sony that happened a couple of years ago that brought down PlayStation Network, they estimate that cost the company $20 million. And Who, who estimates? Uh, I, the article, I don't know. 
But I mean, you know, they gave away, they had to give away a lot of games and stuff. Anyway, long story short. Um, well, I, speaking about that in particular, just real quick, uh, one of the things that they gave away was, uh, what, a free month of PlayStation Plus? Yes. And that was what ultimately sold me on PlayStation Plus. So, you know, yes. there was some return on, on that eventually, I'm sure. Um, I, I'm always skeptical when third parties say a company lost X amount of dollars. It's, it's, all, it's never that cut and dry. Yeah. Uh, and then they mentioned that the Japanese club Nintendo has been hacked more than 23,000 times. Um, so, like... I, and in, this, what, in what capacity has it been hacked? I, I I did not do research on the individual factoids within the piece itself. Oh, I, all I'm trying to convey is skepticism about the article. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> so do you, so you do not believe that there is any financial cost for companies from hacking I, and phishing? I did not say that. <laughs> I think there is a financial cost. I think it's uh, if a if a company's smart, it's part of the cost of doing business. Now, let's say at the same time. Uh, Cube World just came out, yep, and they can't even sell their game because right. they're under a DDoS all the time, apparently. Yes, um, and I'm not sure why. Why would someone hate on that game? Does anyone know? <laughs> I don't know, and that's one of the things that this article is trying to bring up. They're like, somewhere along the line, hackers turned on game developers and started looking at them as some something they should black hat, and. Um, and there's, there's some good questions there. Why, you know, why would you want to take poor Wale's system down, you know, and make sure that nobody can purchase cube world? Why would you want to do these things? And it's kind of confusing why people would want to like punish the people who bring them joy <laughs> because they're angry teenagers. I you think so. You think it's just, that's all there is to it. No, probably, there's probably a lot more to it than that, but. I mean, do you think, I mean, do you think this is kind of an anonymous thing? Do you think they just sort of like, the the, the tides of, of anonymous activity turn their their skeptical eye on something and then, you know, hordes of little script kiddies start pouring their stuff at the company? I mean, I it, it. it I don't understand why you would want to attack something like that at all. It makes no sense. Right, I don't get it. And if they had like a statement they were trying to make, don't you think they would like be public about it and yeah. say something? Yeah, that's what makes me think it's just angry teenagers. It would be more of a more of a terrorist active kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, but I mean, like you know, and and somebody in the chat room said they do it for the lulls. Okay, there's a difference between like lulls, which inconveniences other people, and lulls, which inconveniences you and your friends. And it seems to me that like making Cube World so that your friends can't buy it is a bad plan if it's a good game. Right. No, it doesn't make any sense. There's no logic to it. Yeah. At all. So I'm maybe I uh, the hacker is Honey Badger, <laughs> <laughs> and and Honey Badger don't care. Apparently, it it very well could be. Oh that. man, it makes so much sense now. <laughs> Well, I will provide a link to the show in the show notes to uh, that particular story. Um, the next one I'm going to bring up, and and Spencer was picking on me that my news this week was this was kind of weak, but um, uh, it, was a, it was not your fault. It's just a weak news week. Yes, so. a weak, weak news week. Weak, weak news week. <laughs> so this was uh, basically an article of, from The Verge uh, Gaming, and uh, basically the Wii U's flagship title was not profitable. Zombie U, which was like the first game that came out that actually used the hardware in a manner that like showed that the Wii U was, you know, that the that there was a use for the way they designed the Wii U, mm -hmm. um, it, it was not profitable. Um, now, when I look at the numbers, you know, Wii U's are, they're still selling. People are buying them. Um, the Wii U's or the, the, the Zombie U? The Wii U's. Um, and I think that Zombie U was, you know, a, a decent opening title for it. Uh, I did, I, like, the only game... I have a Wii U and I didn't get it. It didn't seem worth it to me. <laughs> really? It got so much good press beforehand as being a, a really good use of the hardware and being a fun game. You know, if... Uh, I'm just over... I, I, I don't want anything to do with zombies. <laughs> I'm not, I'm oh, not, no, I'm no. not saying that to be like, like, 
you know, uh, contrary. I'm serious. It's like if I see something with zombies in it, I'm just like, well, I know what this is going to be. Well, don't There's play Last be... of Us then. <laughs> <laughs> those are those are mushroom zombies. That's different. Oh. <laughs> well, um, anyway, so that's just a, kind of an interesting factoid. Here, here's an article uh, that I'll, that I'll share with you. I, I really think that they needed to come out with a good, strong um, Mario title that used the hardware right. Um, I don't know why they went the direction that they did, but uh, here's hoping that uh, I, I and I mean. I I will probably end up getting a Wii U just because my kids as I don't necessarily want my kids doing all their gaming on the PlayStation. Um, I want them to have some other system that they're that they're doing their gaming on, and I think the Wii might be a a good option. Uh, and so, I'm I'm just curious, what's your rationale about it not not being all the all on the PlayStation? Well, number one is uh, I feel like uh, the Nintendo hardware is designed to work with kids a little bit better. Um, now my kids are playing Disney, Disney universe and Skylanders on the PlayStation and they're enjoying it. But for some reason, I think it's because we use the PlayStation for like our Netflix machine and our Blu-ray player and that kind of stuff. I, I think I want them to play more on another device. That's not my main mm. media providing machine. <laughs> um, just want to push them away. Yes, I'm like, go, 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 mess with that one. Go here. If you break the Wii, I won't get mad. You know. Well, well I mean, I will. But um, you know, wait for a game to come out on the on the Wii before you get one. Yeah, I will. <laughs> uh, so, and then the last thing, and I thought this was kind of interesting. Microsoft. Uh, there, there is a story going out that Microsoft was actually trying to acquire Zynga before the Xbox head, uh, Don uh, Matrick, Matrick, uh, decided to move to Zynga. Uh, so I'll just link to that article. It's kind of interesting. Um, it's just allegedly, but still it adds another vector onto the things we were talking about last week. Wouldn't it be embarrassing if he left, joined Zynga, and then got bought by Microsoft. Isn't, didn't player. there happen to a guy at, at, at Ubisoft? Probably. Yeah, it like the guy, I don't remember his name. The guy that uh, originally created Assassin's Creed, he left the company and he was working on something with, uh, uh, what's the company that went bust just recently? The oh, big publisher. Uh, yeah, uh, THX. THQ. THQ, yeah. THQ, yeah. He was working on something for THQ. In the THQ fallout, Ubisoft bought that company that he was working with and then fired him. Oh. <laughs> oh. Brutal. So if you're a regular listener to the show, you know these things, but I want to go over them for all our new listeners. First off, uh, if you are interested, you can get a free Netflix trial. Go to netflix.com slash deadworkersparty. You can get 30 free days, and you will help support the show a little bit. Um If you go there, sign up for 30 days. They get all kinds of great stuff. I'm still watching Black Books. That's my going to sleep show lately. And it's, and I've been so exhausted because of the baby that like I I last about like five minutes. So a good show will last me all week long. Um, But yeah, go and check that out and and go to netflix.com slash dead workers party. Get a free. 30-day subscription to Netflix Instant Streaming. Additionally, you can go to audible.com slash core elements and get a free audiobook to try out. Uh, additionally, after that, you'll have a 30-day free trial, which you can then purchase ga- purchase more books, pardon me. And uh, if you decide to subscribe, it's only like $14.95 a month, and you get a free audiobook each month, plus 30% off all additional purchases. Uh, it's really actually a pretty good deal. And lastly, if you go to lootcrate.com slash deadworkersparty, and use the coupon code DEAD, you can get a $3 off your Loot Crate order, which gets you all kinds of cool, geeky swag sent to your door that you can fill your um, your cubicle up with. And all these are available on the show notes. If you go to deadworkers.com, uh, you can see the show notes listed under the Core Elements podcast heading. Inspiration. So, Ben. So... How do you uh, how, how do you do your music? Like like uh, what? How do you how do you actually like produce your music? Are, are you like a keyboard guy? Are you working, you know, on the? Are you working on your on your computer? What's your focus there? I know uh, he does not do it on the uh, ukulele. That's true. <laughs> I do not use the ukulele. 
I have a monster of a PC and a piano and a keyboard and a ton of software. Are you doing, um, are, are, I mean, like, what's the, what's the current musical standard? Are you, are you, is it still MIDI? Are you doing all this with MIDI stuff or what, you know, what are you doing? I'm using a digital audio workstation called Cubase. Uh, oh, yeah. There, there are some things that are like MIDI involved, but uh, MIDI itself not used so much anymore. I think yeah. like a lot of uh, MIDI sort of in the background now. It's kind of hard to explain, and even I don't really know <laughs> all of it very well. <laughs> I'm a musician, uh, so. But yeah, it's it's all digital. I have the stay. I'm actually at my. Here, let me. You can see my setup here. Ooh, very nice. Yeah. With the acoustic tiling, there's the banjo and the piano. Nice. So, yeah. So, um, and and I, I, the resident DWP musician was here earlier, and he wanted to ask me about your arpeggios. Is that what he? What I'm supposed to ask him yep. about? He says you use a lot of arpeggios. Apparently, that that is true. And I do. And and he wanted to know like what you're what you're how why, how you're doing all that. How? I well I I didn't understand his question. <laughs> Just w- w- why why uh, why <laughs> um, why so arpeggios? Ar- arpeggios are just uh, sort of rapid notes in succession. Like uh, you take a chord and turn it into arpeggio, and so. Um, I do it like any other notes, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I don't use any special equipment or anything, if that's what he's wondering. Okay. That's not what he was wondering. He just oh. said, hey, I noticed he used a lot of arpeggios. Ask him about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was something it's like true. that. Yeah. I like arpeggios. I like rapid notes. I like lots of notes. So they showed up in FTL. And so, uh, what kind of what kind of um, it's not. I don't want to like ask. What are your, what are your? Uh, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> you're still <laughs> like, sick. What kind right? of music do you listen to when you're not listening to game music, or is there specific game music that you like, or anything like that? I really like Queen. Um, well, who doesn't? Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's like saying you also like breathing. Come on, man. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have any influences? Like, like when you think about where your music comes from and where your motivation comes from, what kind of stuff do you, do you kind of draw back on? I really liked William Orbit when I was growing up. Oh, he's kind of obscure. Uh, he does this kind of electronic stuff, uh, in like the late eighties and the nineties. I listened to a lot of terrible German trance when I was a very young teenager. And I think, like it or not, it definitely influenced me. Uh, (laughs) You and I are one and the same. (laughs) I still do, so. Okay, yeah, I would go to the record store and I would just buy, like, random CDs. Because there's, you know, in the 90s, like, listening to music was uh, terrible compared to it is now, you know, like. Now you can go on Spotify and listen to whatever, but before, if you if you couldn't go listen to something on the radio, you were out of luck. You know, you just you had to take your chances on buying a CD and hope that it had good stuff on it. Yeah, I remember those days very well, and and I I actually did college radio down at Auburn, and I never oh, cool. forget walking into the studio the first time and looking around and not seeing anything, and there were no albums on the shelf that I had heard on you know local Huntsville radio, and I just, it was this great liberating thing that there was this room full of music I could listen to that I had <laughs> never heard of, and. And it was, it was really, really awesome. I, and it's, I can't imagine what it's like really for kids nowadays because it's true. You know, I, I would sometimes like hear a song on the radio and it would, it would be something that I wanted like to own. And so I would have a tape player next to the speaker and I would hit record (laughs) into a 
tape deck not connected. There were no wires connecting these two devices. <laughs> <laughs> and I would I would listen back to the to you know or, or like I remember loving the uh, theme song to the Greatest American Hero, and so oh I recorded God. it with a tape deck at the TV You're player. Yourself, Wes. Huh? You're dating yourself. That's okay. I'm all right with that. Um, I, I uh, will date myself. I remember seeing the first time uh, Human Behavior by Bjork was uh, on MTV, and I got on my bicycle and rode six miles to the record store so I could buy it. <laughs> nice. But yeah, college radio was, oh, God, I'll never forget that. That was so awesome. <laughs> you have to, to, to get um, game soundtracks, I would hold a tape player up to my tv and just like sit in a level you know and not move around so that it would just be the music and no sound effects and record that were you always kind of fascinated with game music i mean like like was it something in particular or was it just another form of music to you uh it was definitely like called to me somehow i'm not really sure what it was but yeah i was i was really into game music when i was a kid Cause I mean, I, there's a lot of games that like, I remember the music, but, but it's, it's very rare for it to really seep into things. And like Spencer was talking last week about how he was putting the persona four, um, soundtrack into his car, three. persona three soundtrack into his car. And I really can't think of any games whose soundtracks I have chosen to listen to as my, as my background music. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my wife... Well, have you heard the Persona 3 soundtrack? No. <laughs> but now, my wife uh, had, um, had uh, you know, the, the music in your wedding where you where it, you have playing while everybody comes in and picks their side and sits down and everything. My wife put the uh, Elwyn Forest theme from World of Warcraft in there. Wow, that's wow. nerdy. Yep. Yeah. But it's pretty. It's pretty music. Nice. Um... And actually, so so like, uh, have, how do you feel about the whole chip tones music thing that's been going on with like people going and doing live video game concerts? Have you ever thought about like branching out into that arena? Um, once in a while, I've thought about it, but then I moved on with my life. <laughs> but no, <laughs> uh, it it it's kind of fun. I I go do those kind of things sometimes, but usually if I want to go see a live show, I'll go see something like like folk music or something instead. Right. Or Slayer. <laughs> Slayer. Or Slayer. <laughs> yeah. I've got to say, I heard the latest Black Sabbath album, and I, I don't normally like Sabbath, but it was awesome. I think, I, I can't decide if it's the fact that I'm starting to bond with Ozzy Osbourne because I'm old, um, <laughs> but I was, I, was, I was very, very impressed. Uh, so... Uh, and I'm probably going to cut this part out because I don't really know what to ask next. Um, Is there anything uh, you want to talk about? Yeah. Like here? Me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, you know, I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what like are are there are there any directions you want to go with your music like is there a particular gaming style you're interested like when you imagine like writing music for games do you is there is there something in your head about where you want to go or what you want to do with that yeah uh actually the funny thing was that uh i went on twitter a few months ago and i said you know i really want to do a a soundtrack to a horror game is anyone <laughs> making a horror game and then i got like five responses and so that's why I'm doing this current like uh, murder mystery game. The one you're not allowed to talk about. The one that I'm not allowed to talk about. Uh, but yeah, I really want to do like a, a like a Silent Hill style horror game someday. That would be really fun. And that's actually one of the environments where I think m music affects you the most. Like I, I think horror is one of those genres that like more than anything else, other than like epic battle music. I think epic battle music and horror music are the ones that can actually directly influence your mood the most when you're playing yeah, the game. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's move on to some uh, questions from our listeners. Um, one, um, uh, the first one is from Ben Anderson, and he wrote, and this is actually what, what got me to reach out to you when I saw you on Twitter. Uh, I really enjoy music and games and consider it to be a major part of enjoyment for me. However, I've met other people who immediately turn off the game music. Where do you stand on that? Um, 
I, I I actually do not turn off game music. Um, I, I know that like I'll watch a lot of s- streams of like MOBAs and things like that, and people will put on their own music. Uh, it feels weird to me. I, I also think that because I feel like the music kind of helps shape the mood of what you're doing. Uh, I, I there's very few times now it if I'm playing something like Minecraft some time I'll turn it off to like record or if I'm playing WoW and doing dailies or something like that and I want to watch Netflix while I'm doing it you know I'll turn off the music then but other than that no always the sign of a really engaging game when you have to watch Netflix. <laughs> Ah, it's not absurd. that. It's that there are things that you want to do, I'm just, but I'm, I'm I'm just pushing your buttons. I wet. know. Jeez. Stop <laughs> it, God. What about you, Spencer? Do you ever turn off the music? I um, am actually pretty similar to you. Like uh, I very rarely turn off the game music. Like, and uh, even even when it's, for example, an MMO like like Wow, that I've heard literally the same song. Eight billion times within the last two months, uh, it just sort of becomes part of the game for me, and, and I, I very rarely think to turn it off. Ben, are you a traitor to your kind? <laughs> uh, I have to admit that while I keep the sound effects on, I whenever I play Half Life Two, I always turn the music off. Really? Yeah, because I think it's actually a better experience without music. I think the game. Uh, should not have had music. Is it because of the ambient noise? I mean, I mean, is that what it is? What, what, what? Is there something else in the audio that you're trying that you want to pick up on, or is it that you feel it's a much more natural experience with no soundtrack? I think that last part you said. I think that Half Life Two is intensely first person. Like more, it's even more first person than most first person games. Where, like, it is exceptionally first person. It's exceptionally <laughs> first person. Yeah, it's like you play Call of Duty, and it's first person, but it still feels like you're in like an action movie, right? Yeah. Um, Half Life goes to great lengths to make it feel like you're in, you you are Gordon Freeman. You're actually there, and I feel like music takes away from that. Right. Um, I can see that, and 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 I think. Like, and we, we were talking with um, Joe McDonough a couple of weeks ago, and he made the point that he feels like cutscenes pull you out of the action. And that is one of the things about Half-Life is it keeps you in the character, in the character's right. skin the whole time. And so, like, dramatic, you know, adding that dramatic musical element, I can imagine also suspends a little bit of your disbelief. Yeah, it takes away from it for me anyway. So it's like a personal choice. So I always turn the music. I love Half-Life, too. Uh, but yeah, I always turn the music off. Other than that, though, no, I I always play games with the music. Yeah, you like Queen and you like Half Life too, man. <laughs> I also play NetHack. That was pretty obscure, right? <laughs> <laughs> the music on that is amazing. Yeah. Um, I love the music in NetHack. <laughs> so our next question: This is from Anthony Junk. He says, with regards to the controversy with the use of Hindu Hindu gods, because we had on uh, Todd Harris about a month ago, month and a half ago. F- talking about smite and i asked him about the hindu gods that he put in his game and the backlash associated with that uh he says are there other things that may be untouchable by the genre at the moment unlike other mediums certain thematic elements are considered taboo for instance any game um uh, any game that has sex in it is instantly stigmatized. Do you see this changing soon? Will the advent of indie, of the indie scene help alleviate the controversial use of religion sex or substance abuse you know, most of the games from the indie scene that have taken off to any uh, great degree have been fairly politically light. Yeah. Um, there have been, you know, explicitly political indie games, but they they certainly have not hit the market saturation of something like, well, let's, let's you know, Minecraft clearly has no political innings um, other than skeletons are bad. Um uh, let's even say FTL. FTL, what does it say? You know, apparently rebels have more spaceships than, than the rest of the <laughs> galaxy. Yeah. I've never understood that. Um, but, you know, there have been, uh, there have been political games like, uh, what was it? Uh, 
I'm trying to think. There's the, the the cat and the some. I don't remember. And there's a game about the uh, Iranian Revolution. Oh wait, yeah, I can't remember and, the name uh, of it though. Yeah, I don't remember. And then there was, uh, you know, there was more recently the game uh, about being homeless. Uh, I don't remember what the name of that one was, like Cart something. I don't. Yeah, and there was I, also I, my, oh Cart Life, yeah. Cart Life, yeah. My game knowledge is sort of failing me at the moment, but um, they are f- pretty rare, and I don't know. I don't see that changing simply because I don't really think there's much of a market for it. Which is unfortunate. I think there's a lot of room for, for that kind of game. Just not a lot of people want to pay for it. I, I I think there's a certain amount of escapism that people want in their games, and sometimes, for instance, I think a lot of people won't play The Last of Us because it's a big feely experience. Um, they 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 might play it because it is you know the blockbuster of this era you know of this period um but i i think a lot of people don't necessarily like to pick up heavy-handed subjects in their casual gameplay um sex in particular i think is stigmatized m- in games mostly because it just feels silly addressing sexuality in an environment that is devoid of physical sensation feels a little paradoxical. So, uh, I mean, what about movies? Um, uh, there's there's there, no physical s- s- sensation. But I, th- I think there's to, more to immersion there. I think the Uncanny Valley screws it up. <laughs> you see, and, and that's the thing, is I think it, I, I can think of very few instances in which I think sex has been done well. Yeah. Right. Um, I think this, most of it is just no one's done it. Yeah. Yet. I well, mean, the game that I'm working on right now has so much sex in it, you have no <laughs> idea. But I, I mean, I, I do think that you can deal with certain things. For instance, you know, there's Depression Quest, which is all about, like, it's kind of this experience, this game associated with ex- uh, of living with depression. That's not really something I want to pick up. Um, I have to be in the right, it's the same reason I don't, you know, as a tired parent of three, I don't pick up a lot of really deep, um, art house movies right now. I, I like, I want to watch a blockbuster. I want to watch, you know, a comedy. I want to watch certain, uh, these more light heart, the lighthearted fair, or if it's going to, you know, go a little deeper, I want it, you know, to have certain kinds of spit and polish. You are what's wrong with gaming right now. <laughs> I hate you. Um, but I, but I think that it, I can't, I do think these subjects can be approached well. Uh, I think I don't necessarily think I'm opposed to being involved or uh, being exposed to these things. And I think indie gaming right now has a better chance to bite into some of these subjects than at any point in our history of gaming. But I, I'm not necessarily sure it's because they're taboo as because you're, you're going to probably alienate part of your audience when you address them. See, And I'm all for that. Screw the audience. And I'm not being silly here. I'm being very serious. Uh, whenever I hear people, well, first of all, let me ask Ben, what do you think on the, our games art thing? Do you, what, do, where do you fall on that? Uh, I believe games can be art if they try hard enough. Okay. See, and and I sort of feel like they they can be as well. However, the endless quest to have an audience is what ruins the idea of games as art for me. Because art, for me, is about expression. And if all of your expression is completely focused on, will people want to consume this part of my expression, then I start to lose you. Um, and, and so I... I, I like looking at these free games, uh, you know, Rock Paper Shotgun has this list of free games every year, every week. That a lot of them are very unplayable, but that's not really the point of them. So you know, I'm, I'm I think that that's where we're going to see that come out. Yeah. If I, I made any sense right there. I'm no, right. you did. You did <laughs> it, through through your your sick uh, babbling. Um, yeah, I, don't I sound great? Yeah, you do. You're, I, you're I sound. I, like I, 
my incredibly vibrant voice uh, from normally has been completely devastated. Yeah. So, and and you know, I, I I think I agree with you. I feel that if you're going to do a story on one of these, you know, a game on one of these taboo subjects, you kind of have to ditch the whole idea of appealing to an audience and just create what it is that you want to create. And therefore, it might not make money, um, but it'll be amazing for what it's doing. I, so. I think that over time, we'll just see, I mean, more and more people will be making games that address serious issues. And I think that over time, as techniques get better to make games more accessible in general, that like, I think that just like, it's a matter of time. Yeah. We'll just start to see games break taboos. Yeah. And it will appear normal, just like films. So, um, so if you were going to do a soundtrack for a game about sex, could you give us a few like bars? <laughs> like, what would it be like? Let me let me go get my uh, my whammy bar. <laughs> uh, not going for Bolero. Okay, yeah, anyway, um, so I think that's going to about wrap us up for this show. Uh, ben, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, no problem. I, I uh, your game your game music was very um, it, it it made a impact on a bunch of people i there's many many people who pointed out to me you know oh you got that guy coming on oh awesome i love that that music was great nice. um and uh well, you FTL would not have been the game that it was without the soundtrack hey yeah. thanks man i yeah. and i would not turn off the soundtrack for fdl <laughs> yeah Good to know. Um, and so one of the other things that you have done is you have brought me some um, keys for some copies of the FTL soundtrack. Um, I will have those up on the website um, w the day that this episode gets released. I believe I'm going to release it on Thursday. Uh, and we'll put some of the uh, keys for a copy of the soundtrack to um, FTL up so that some of our listeners can dig into that and enjoy that. Cool. And thank you for bringing that to us. Yeah, no problem. In the meantime, like I said, next week we have um, Teddy Lee from... Uh, is, is that his name? Did I say it right? Is my Yes, Teddy Lee from Cellar Door Games, uh, the makers of Rogue Legacy. They're going to be joining us, uh, and depending on whether I am able to get my Play on Con stuff done to the point where I can actually leave my house and come to the studio, uh, where I'll do recording, but... Uh, thank you for joining us again. Please go and leave us some iTunes reviews. Um, tell your friends about the show. Uh, I, I think we've got a really excellent show going here, and everybody who listens to it seems to really enjoy it, and you should share it. And uh, when it comes out, be sure to check out Unnamed Point and Click, his mystery horror game. <laughs> <laughs> I will mention it on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, have a great week. Take care. Thanks. You've been listening to Core Elements, exploring gaming one element at a time, a podcast by the Dead Workers Party. See the show notes and get more information at coreelements.deadworkers.com or leave us a voicemail at 256-812-1010. Dead Workers Party Network. Tastes better than babies.